Uh, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn to uh, the Gospel according to Mark. The Gospel according to Mark. We're continuing in our series on the, the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to Mark. And uh, this morning we're going to be in uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. I think I have that right this week. Mark chapter 6, verses uh, 1 to to 13. <coughs> I'm just going to begin by uh, reading our passage for us. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. This is Jesus, in case you didn't catch that. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Uh, one of the privileges uh, I had was being able to uh, do my pastoral internship under uh, my father, uh, who is also a pastor at the church where I grew up. Um, our family moved to Garrington, which is just southwest of, of Red Deer, about 45 minutes, uh, when I was um, four years old. So Garrington Community Church was the only church that I uh, really had ever known. And when you grow up uh, in the same church all your life, people tend to, to know you quite well. And I say that it was a privilege to be able to enter and out the church where I grew up, and it, and it certainly was. Uh, but it was a, also a, a very eye-opening experience, uh, both for the church and for me. There, there were certain uh, hurdles that we all needed to, to overcome, uh, the, the biggest one being familiarity. Uh, I had been away from that church for three years before we uh, did our uh, internship there, uh, but there was still this, this issue of familiarity. Uh, here was the kid that they knew and saw grow up uh, standing behind the pulpit preaching, and it's, uh, it's a little hard to uh, speak authoritatively from the Word of God when there are some people there who are having a hard time taking you seriously. Uh, And in our passage for this morning, Jesus is back in his hometown after a couple years, maybe. Uh, He's back where he spent the majority of his growing up years. He is back where he used to do all kinds of carpentry work for people. Uh, My parents, they're both from the the Saskatoon area. And after they got married, my dad got into framing houses in Saskatoon. Um, He eventually owned his own construction company where um, he, w- which he had for a number of years before uh, selling it to go into to pastoral ministry. But growing up, every summer, we would uh, take a week of holidays and, and we would travel to Saskatoon to visit family. 
And every year, uh, basically without fail, uh, as soon as we were in Saskatoon, my dad would be pointing out all the houses that uh, he helped build. And, uh, you know, we would get to, to Warman, where uh, my parents grew up, and uh, they would point out, you know, the, the house that they grew up in and uh, the, ho- the first house that they lived in when they, when they were married and, you know, other notable landmarks like that. Uh, and I don't know if Jesus did that. I, I don't know... Uh, if he took his disciples around to see, you know, all the houses that he helped build or, or other notable landmarks. But uh, we do know where Jesus does go, and that's to uh, the synagogue. Um, and we don't know exactly what Jesus w- was teaching on uh, in this particular Sabbath day. Um, th- there is a good indication that this instance in Mark is the same instance that Luke uh, records in his gospel in Luke chapter 4. Uh, in which case uh, the text that Jesus taught on would have been uh, Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, but what we're going to see for our time together this morning is that uh, the people of Jesus' hard time have uh, Jesus' hometown have a hard time taking Jesus seriously. Uh, th- they know Jesus, they saw Jesus grow up, but there's this issue of familiarity that they can't seem to overcome. Uh, and so what we're going to see is the people's reaction to Jesus and Jesus' response to the people's reaction. Right, so we're going to see the people's reaction to Jesus and Jesus' response to the people's <coughs> reaction. So first we see the reaction, the people's reaction to Jesus. Look at verse 2. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Uh, Now, throughout Mark's gospel, we've seen people constantly astonished with Jesus, right? Uh, Back in Mark chapter 1, verse 22, it says that the people of Capernaum, right, where Jesus did a number of his um, uh, miracles, spent a a good portion of his, his ministry, people of Capernaum, they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not... Interesting phrase, and not as the scribes, right? Uh, Jesus clearly doesn't teach the the blatant moralism of his day, you know, where you just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and and attempt to earn God's favor by adhering to all the the rules and regulations that were in place, right? Uh, And the people are astonished with Jesus because he really had the words that lead to eternal life. Um, Adhering to, to moralism is only going to lead to death because you're trying to uh, live the perfect life that, that you can't live. But how much more life-giving is it to know that uh, God came to this world and lived that perfect life for you so that if you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus as the perfect Son of God, you will be saved. Right? The, the work is done for you. Your, your freedom from the penalty of your sin is being purchased. All your, your striving to earn what you can never earn yourself can cease because of Jesus. That's, that's the good news of Jesus Christ that, that for, for all people that we teach and preach. And, and the people of, of Jesus' hometown, they're in this, this privileged position where they have had this perfect Son of God in their midst for 30 years before Jesus begins his his public ministry. And yet, what's their reaction when when he returns? What's their reaction? They're they're astonished at him, right? We see that same, same word, but they're not astonished in a good way. They're astonished in a skeptical way. They can't believe that this Jesus, you know, right, whom they saw grow up, could say and do what they had heard Jesus was saying and doing from the, the good folks in Capernaum. But look at verse 3. The people continue. Is, is not this the, the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? There are, and not our, are not his sisters here with us? Right? It says they, they took offense at him. Uh, the word for offense here it comes from the Greek word scandalon, which means a stumbling block. And what this means is that the people of Jesus' hometown didn't accept Jesus' message concerning himself because they didn't accept Jesus as the Son of God. Their, their problem isn't with Jesus' teaching. Their problem is with 
Jesus himself. They, they know Jesus' parents. They, they know his brothers and sisters. They even know the kind of work he did as a carpenter. But they also know that he never had any kind of formal teaching, didn't sit under uh, a rabbi, didn't go to Bible college, you know, that kind of thing. So how could this Jesus say what he's saying about himself? Their, their stumbling block, you see, is, is with Jesus himself. That's why Jesus says in, in verse 4, a prophet is not without honor except in his home town and, and among his relatives and his own household. They had let familiarity with Jesus cloud their judgment about him. They had let familiarity with Jesus cloud their judgment about Jesus. And this is a problem for, for so uh, many people. They, they, they know the stories about Jesus. You know, they know all these cool sayings and, and really cool facts about Jesus, but when it comes to following Jesus as Lord and King, they take offense because they already know about Jesus. Why, why would they need to submit to him as Lord? They're, they're fine with, with what Jesus, uh, you know, says about, you know, doing to others what you would have them do unto you. They're, they're fine with that. But when, when Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, then you see people take offense at Jesus. Well, then that's exclusive. And people take offense. But here's the reality. Sooner or later, uh, each one of us is going to be offended by Jesus because the gospel is naturally offensive to us. Uh, we, we, we don't like to be told that we are uh, sinners in need of a Savior. We, we want to be told that uh, we are perfect just the way we are, uh, and that we don't need to change, and, and that the uh, problem with the world is that uh, they can't just accept us for who we are. But this flies in the face of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, you know, we are naturally dead in our trespasses and sins, and that following Jesus actually means denying myself, and, and that the problem with the world lies first and foremost in me. We, you see, we're, we're naturally going to be offended by Jesus because everything about Jesus is offensive to our sinful human nature. But the question is, what will our reaction be to the offense of Jesus? Well, what will our reaction be to the offense of Jesus? Uh, turn over to, to John chapter 6. Uh, John chapter 6. Uh, this is a passage of scripture that's, that's, always, that's always gotten me. And uh, the imagery here is, is kind of, well, I guess kind of disgusting. But... Um, John, in John chapter 6, uh, Jesus has just fed uh, 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. And in verse 51, uh, Jesus says to the people, uh, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Right? And so you can picture the imagery, right? The, the people begin to wonder, is Jesus actually telling us that we need to eat him in order to live forever. And Jesus says to them in, in verse 53, in graphic detail, in case they didn't already get the picture, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Now, our first reaction to that, right, is that's disgusting. The, the, the imagery is appalling. It's, it's actually this statement from Jesus that uh, made many people in the first century uh, believe that Christians were cannibals because they ate the flesh and drank the, the blood of, of their leader. Now, of course, Jesus here is, is speaking figuratively as he would later demonstrate with the Lord's Supper what he's conveying here and what, he, what he's meaning and we don't actually eat the, uh, the flesh and drink the blood of, of Jesus. But why would Jesus say this? It, it sounds so, so offensive, so invasive. You, know, you, you just know that this kind of language is going to turn a lot of people off, right? E even if they do think it's you know, figuratively speaking. And, and it does. It does turn a lot of people off. Many followers of Jesus has turned back and no longer walked with him. 
right? They, they, they were fine when Jesus was talking about, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, people can, people can grasp that. But when Jesus started talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, they're out. They, they immediately take offense at Jesus. So much so that Jesus asks his, his 12 disciples, the guys who had followed him around and were faithful to him, his entire public ministry, he asks them, do you want to go away as well? Right? Is this too hard for even you guys? But what's their response? What's their response? Lord, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Right? There, there will be those who know a lot about Jesus, but who will abandon Jesus when he offends them. And what Jesus is after are those who are going to follow him and love him and obey him, even if it means being offended by him at first, because he has the words of eternal life and he is the Holy One of God. And so we, we see in the first place the people's reaction to Jesus. They, they took offense at him and thus did not receive his message. Right? I'm not, I'm not going to submit to you as, as Lord and King of this, this kingdom because I don't, I don't believe you. But then we see Jesus' response to the people's reaction. We see, the, we see Jesus' response. Look at verse 5. It says, And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled. He marveled because of their unbelief. Now, earlier, uh, it was the crowd who was, you know, amazed at, at Jesus, right? But, but here it's Jesus who is amazed at his hometown crowd. And Jesus isn't amazed in a good way. He's, he, he's amazed at their unbelief. And it's here where we're confronted, you know, once again with the mystery of the kingdom of God. The, the people, those who had, had every opportunity, right, to believe in Jesus because they grew up with him, they don't. They don't believe in Jesus. But people whom we would never expect to believe in Jesus, like the, you know, the demoniac from across the sea in the land of the Gentiles, would we have expected him? Would, or, or Jairus, the, the ruler of the synagogue, would we have expected him to believe in Jesus? And yet, they get it. They get the kingdom of God. It's why verse 6 says that Jesus went about um, uh, among the villages teaching. When his hometown crowd didn't believe in him, Jesus goes elsewhere. And other people besides his hometown, they get the kingdom of God. The ones who should get it don't. And the ones who we would expect not to get it, they're the ones who get it. It's this upside-down kingdom of God. But there's an important lesson to be learned here, right? If you reject Jesus, he will depart from you to another. If you reject the good news of Jesus Christ, he will go elsewhere. Do we understand the seriousness of what we're reading? Do we understand the implications of Jesus going elsewhere with the good news? It, it doesn't matter if Jesus were to do a, a bunch of miracles in his hometown. We see he, he heals a few people. He heals a few people. But their hearts are so hardened with unbelief that Jesus must remove himself from their midst. We, we see this, this terrifying illustration um, in, in the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. You can turn to, to Revelation chapter 2. It's just the beginning of the, the chapter there. Uh, the church of Ephesus, um, they, they could boast of, of great spiritual leaders in, in, their, uh, in their history. Um, for one, it had the apostle Paul with them for three years. Um, and then Timothy was a kind of pastor there for, for a few years. And the, the, the Apostle John, who, who wrote the gospel according to John, as well as 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he was an elder uh, in the church of Ephesus. So, I mean, they could boast of such godly spiritual leadership. And, and yet we read these words from Jesus in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. 
really striking words, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first, because if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Right? The, the church uh, in Ephesus had become hardened by their sin and, and they were being commanded to repent lest Jesus remove himself from their midst. It, it's a dangerous thing when Jesus removes the opportunity for us to respond to him. It means that our stumbling block is with Jesus himself and he's going to go where he will be received because we clearly don't want Jesus. We clearly don't want Jesus. And so uh, Jesus calls the 12 together after this, this instance with, with his hometown. He, he calls the 12 together and he begins to send them out two by two. He, and he gives them instructions uh, on, on what they're to pack for, for their journey. Uh, he gives them authority over the unclean spirits. Um, and, and he's telling them to go proclaim a message. And what's their message? What are, what are they proclaiming in verse 12? They're proclaiming repentance. They're proclaiming repentance. They're proclaiming that people turn away from their sin and embrace Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? This is the same message that, that John the Baptist proclaimed in Mark chapter 1, verse 4. It's the same message that Jesus has been proclaiming his entire public ministry. This, the, the message doesn't change. It hasn't changed for 2,000 years. The message is still the same. Repent of your sin and believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the gospel message. Now look, Jesus gives them instructions on what they are to do when, when people won't listen to them and won't receive their message. Where Jesus says to them, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Do you think they were expecting their message of repentance to be rejected? Do you think that they, they heard this from Jesus and thought, oh, okay, well, let's expect to be rejected, right? I mean, w- when, you, when you come across people who have adhered to moralism all of their lives, and they would have, um, the, the disciples would have encountered these, these people, you're, you're bound to encounter some tension. Right? When, when you tell people who have lived their entire lives trying to earn God's favor and think that you know, they're doing an all right job, that they're in fact sinners who need to repent of their sin and believe in Jesus to be saved, there's bound to be some friction there. There's no, there's no fluff when it comes to preaching repentance. It's not like the disciples could preach you know, feel-good messages where you just leave, leave feeling affirmed to continue living the life you want to live. No, the message of repentance is invasive and it requires a change of mind. If we respond to the gospel message by surrendering our lives to King Jesus, we will not be the same as we were before. Our lives are going to be different. That might take some time. There are uh, people on various points of this, this path that we call the Christian life. But this is the message that is being proclaimed. And, and you have to think that they're going to see some, some resistance to it. But Jesus gives his, his disciples his divine authority over the unclean spirits. And verse 13 says that they cast out many demons and, and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. And if you look down at verse 30, right, they're, they're coming back from their mission trip excited. They're stoked for all they had uh, done and taught. They, they can't believe what they're seeing uh, happen when the, the kingdom of God breaks in through the, the kingdom of darkness. You go even further down and you see that there are 5,000 men uh, following Jesus now, and that's not even including women and children. They're, they're, they're not seeing a resistance to the gospel message. They're seeing a hunger and a thirst for it. And do you know why? Because Jesus went elsewhere. Because Jesus came to them with the good news. 
the, the response of Jesus to the people's reaction who don't want him is that Jesus is going to go elsewhere. He's going to go and give other people the opportunity to respond to being confronted by the weight of their sin compared to the, the beauty and majesty of a holy God. And they're going to respond. They're going to respond. They do respond. If, if you think, if you're here and you, you think that you don't need Jesus in your life, then he will go to another who does. And they will receive the good news that is more life-giving than anything the world is telling us to believe. But this also serves to remind us that uh, Jesus is going to be offensive. He, he is He's going to invade our lives and start rearranging our priorities, and it's, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. It's, it's going to even be a little painful at times, I'm sure. Uh, but there is a joy and a relief that comes from confessing our sin and believing in Jesus. The question is, have, have we done this? Have we done this? Have, have we confessed with our mouth that Jesus is Lord? Do, do we believe that, that Christ's perfect life and his, his substitutionary death provides the, the sufficient payment for our sin? Or, or, or is Jesus too offensive for us to believe in? Is Jesus too offensive for us to believe in? Uh, we sang a, a song earlier in the service called How Deep the Father's Love for Us. And uh, I just want to read the lyrics for us as we close our time together because I believe these words fly in the face of our culture. Uh, but they're truly words that we need to uh, hear as they reflect the reality of what took place on the cross where Jesus died. Uh, the song says, How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. What are some ways, church, that Jesus is still offensive to us? Uh, is there anything about Jesus that, that we can't seem to get over? Our, are there any stumbling blocks that keep us from believing that he is the perfect, suffering son of God? I just want you to know that Jesus is bigger than your questions. If you are wrestling this morning with a person in Jesus Christ, it's probably a good thing. It means you have not hardened your heart towards him. In fact, I would argue that we should have questions there is no tension between us and Jesus, and it might be an indication that we are too familiar with him. If he doesn't amaze us anymore, then we have potentially lost our awe of him. If he doesn't offend us, then our Christianity might be too comfortable. And I mean, if you want to talk uh, about some of these things with me after the service, I'd be more than willing to do so. I certainly don't have all the answers. I'm sure there are individuals here who would be uh, better equipped to, to tackle uh, some of the difficult questions you might have, but I, I certainly know where to turn when I do have questions. We have a Savior and King who is so great and so glorious
but he is able to handle whatever offense you might have against him. Will we come to him today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we thank you for the, the sweet and simple message that there is forgiveness found in Jesus. And we pray for those with hard questions here this morning. We recognize that you are Lord over all, including our greatest obstacles to the faith. And so, God, we pray that by the illumination of your spirit, we would be filled with wisdom and understanding of who you are, who we are, and how needy we are for you. We ask for your presence to go with us as we leave here today. And that you would give us the boldness to preach this message of repentance that is laid out in your word and to do so with gentleness and respect. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.